Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to our virtual field trip on Cumberland Island. Um, we're super excited to bring this to you today. I am Dottie Head, Director of Communications for Georgia Audubon, and we are thrilled to host this virtual event. Um, we've got some of our staff and others down on Cumberland Island, so I am going to turn it over to Karina Newsom, our Director of Community Engagement, to kick things off. All right, thank you so much, Dottie. Hello everyone, thank you so much for joining us. We are so excited to be uh, live from the beautiful Cumberland Island and showing you the biodiversity of birds and other wildlife that we're seeing here on the island, as well as telling you a little bit about why this particular barrier island is so important. So as Dottie said, my name is Karina Newsom. I'm the Community Engagement Manager here at Georgia Audubon. And I'm going to introduce you to the other folks who are on this live stream with us who are going to be sharing all kinds of wonderful information with you. Um, and first, we have got Jessica who will introduce herself. Hi there, Jessica here from Wild Cumberland. Thank you so much for joining us, Jessica. And Adam Betchel, our Director of Conservation, is also here with us. So Adam, if you want to jump on and introduce yourself as well. Thank you so much. Sorry, we're, we're playing with the audio, so there's no feedback. Hey, everybody. This is Adam Betchel, Director of Conservation for Georgia Audubon, and I am about 30 feet away from Karina also taking in the exciting landscapes and birds of Cumberland. So thank you. Awesome. And then I'm going to pass it over to Kim, who is actually on Jekyll Island. And Kim Savides is a new member of the Georgia Audubon team. Um, while she's not on Cumberland Island, she's on Jekyll Island, which is a nearby barrier island on the coast of Georgia. And we brought her on today because she's going to be seeing a different kind of diversity of birds that you can also see right here on Cumberland Island. And if ever our internet gets spotty, because we are very much uh, in a remote area here on Cumberland Island, she'll be able to keep, keep the webinar going with some really awesome birds. And so Kim, if you wanna hop on um, and introduce yourself, we would love to, to meet you. Yeah, yeah, hello everyone. Thanks for that intro. Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm Kim Savitas. I'm a new Sea Grant Fellow um, for Georgia Audubon. Um, I'm located here on the coast. Um, and yeah, today I'm on Jekyll Island. And uh, yeah, unfortunately my, my phone is mounted uh, to my scope right now. Um, but yeah, I'll just show you some pelicans real quick. Um, yeah, happy to be here. And hopefully I'll get to show you some cool birds. Awesome, thank you so much, Kim. So we are going to go ahead um, and get started. And before we do, if you ever have any questions as we're talking and as you're seeing birds and learning about the island, if you're in the webinar, feel free to go ahead and put your questions into the Q&A chat function. And Dottie will relay those questions to us and we'll answer them um, as they come in. If you're watching from Facebook, you can go ahead and put your comments and or questions in the chat function or on the comments section. Um, and those questions will be relayed to us as well. So do feel free to ask any questions that you have. Um, so without further ado, I'm going to um, turn it back over to Jessica to kind of introduce this incredible um, island that we're situated on right now called Cumberland Island. Um, so I'm gonna put it right over uh, to our uh, Director of Wild Cumberland, Jessica. Thank you all so much for joining. I'm glad that the reception has held up so far. And I know everybody's eager to see the birds and wildlife that we're looking at. But um, I did want to take a minute and make sure everybody understands my action, the significance <laughs> of a place like this, um, because it is our, our state's southernmost barrier island. And most of the northern portion of it, in fact, almost 20,000 acres were originally protected as wilderness. And that is a congressionally designated level of protection that makes it such an incredible habitat for shorebirds and marsh birds like we're going to be seeing today. So thanks. Yes. All right. Um, so as Jessica said, Cumberland Island is a really incredible place, um, protected area that serves such a, an important uh, service to a variety of different kinds of animals. Of course, we'll be focusing on birds today, but it supports a lot of biodiversity. So I'm going to pass it back over to Adam to talk a little bit about um, why Cumberland Island is so important and why its location matters so much, particularly for our Georgia birds. So Adam, over to you. All right, I think Adam is present, so I'm going to come over to Adam. Here we go. <laughs> so I'm glad we had a contingency plan for this, just in case. Um, yeah, so we're here on Cumberland, and as Jessica just mentioned, it's a super place for many reasons, um, but for birds in particular. And so there's a few key reasons. There's kind of three 
broad habitat types, I'll say, that are good for birds. So we have the amazing maritime forests that take up most of the interior of the island. We have the dunes and the beaches, which we're not visiting today, but Kim is on Jekyll to kind of give you that sense of what that habitat type is like. And then we're here in the salt marsh. And all three of those habitats have completely different birds um, throughout the year. And we're doing it this time of year because it is the beginning of migration. Things are really heating up and we've had some exciting migrants. And all three of those habitats I mentioned are important for different migratory birds. So on the walk over here, Karina and Jessica and I had American red starts and black soda blue warblers and red eyed vireos and summers that new nest here and others that move through in big numbers. So I've been lucky enough to be here in October in the past and just get tons of different warblers, cuckoos. Um, and so the maritime forests are really important for our songbirds. On the beaches, it's critically important for, you know, not only migratory stopover locations, but winter habitat for red knot and American oyster catcher and piping plovers, birds that are really important to all of us Georgians and being studied heavily by uh, our friends at Georgia DNR and Manomet. So super, super important birds that really rely on these isolated Georgia barrier islands. And then finally, the marsh is where we are now. Um, we've had yellow warblers today, a, a pretty numerous bird, but a bird that's kind of hard to find in Georgia away from the coast. They really like these barrier islands. You'll get them out in the salt marsh or you know, in the oaks right on the edge of the forest. So great habitats and great diversity. And this site, because of that importance and because of that knowledge, has been recognized as an important bird area, not only on the state level, but on a global scale. And it's also part of the Western Hemisphere Shorebird Reserve Network, Georgia Barrier Island uh, designation. It's a bit of a, a mouthful. Wizard is what some of us call it. And so all of our barrier islands, including Cumberland, it being the largest and southernmost, are super important for those shorebirds, for the plovers and sandpipers and knots and oyster catchers and things I mentioned earlier. So tons of diversity, hundreds of different types of birds, globally recognized, super important for the, our Georgia birds. And it has exciting breeding birds, painted buntings and yellow-footed warblers, northern perulas, just hundreds and hundreds of different birds. So hopefully we're gonna be able to show you some of those um, and my phone won't be frozen much longer <laughs> and I can show you my scope. But, um, but yeah, it's just a really important place. Uh, it's a place worth protecting and, and the bird life here is just phenomenal. Thanks so much, Adam. Hey, hey, and Adam. So right I, now, I got some questions speak, already. There is a lot of activity in the marsh, and so Adam's out here in the marsh. And so <laughs> Adam's going to go back to his scope. Um, and as we're even hearing, Jessica was talking, we're hearing um, all kinds of <laughs> um, all kinds of plovers out here in the salt marsh. I want to give you just a little bit of a, a pan here, so you can see where we are. So this is kind of, you know, the more upland of the parts of the island. And then out here is the salt marsh. And you can see all of this exposed mud um, because the tide is currently out. So this is a tidal environment, which means that twice a day, the water level comes up and then it goes down at really large amplitudes, actually. Um, and so right now the tide is low, the tide is at its lowest. And you can see all of the oyster beds, a lot of the mud is exposed. And this is oftentimes a really good time for birds to do a lot of foraging. Rosie, it's Spoonbill. Rosie and Spoonbill. Oh my gosh. Y'all, y'all. It landed. Adam, it landed. Y'all, a Rosie and Spoonbill's right here. Oh my gosh. All right, Adam is coming. Um, and he's going to show you all what's going on here. All right. You all might not be able to see it because right now I'm currently on my phone. But Adam is positioning his scope. And as soon as he's got it in the scope, he's going to share it with you all. Um, Adam, in case you're frozen, because you're not coming up on mine, I'm gonna go ahead. Okay, okay, cool. You all, this is incredible. So we were talking about the biodiversity of the animals that can be found here on this island. And this, oh, and it's foraging right now. Okay. Yeah. Alrighty. So we are going to try and get this right in the scope for you. Alrighty. One second here. It is so bright. Hold on, Adam. Here we go. Okay. Wait a second. I'm, oh, I lost it. Hold on. We're almost there. We're almost there. It moved just a little bit. Oh, there we go. Okay. Can you all see that? Oh my goodness. And it's foraging. So this behavior that you're seeing, Adam, if you want to come up over here where I am, if it only if it makes sense. But this behavior that you're seeing is exactly how 
this kind of back and forth kind of waiting that they're doing with their with their heads. They've got a very specialized beak. It is very sensitive on the end and they're called roseate spoonbills, roseate referring to their coloration, but spoonbill referring to the shape of their bill. And this back and forth head motion allows them to essentially use that sensitive spoon shaped beak to detect the movement and presence of their favorite foods in the water. And like I said, because the tide is out right now, they um, are able to kind of access a lot more invertebrates essentially, which is their favorite food to eat. Um, things like shrimp um, and other kind of crustaceans that live in the mud. And the food they eat is actually also what gives them their coloration, their roseate color, their reddish um, pinkish color, much like flamingos. So I always like to say that the spoonbills are kind of like the our version of like a flamingo here in the States. And so we're so lucky to be able to see these birds right here on Cumberland Island. And even more so to see uh, this feeding behavior because sometimes it's hard to, to see this up close in real life because they do really like to be in these tidal channels. So right now, like I showed you earlier, we are in the salt marsh and in the salt marsh, there are tons of channels that cut into it. And if you're kind of at a higher elevation, you really can't see what's going on in the channels unless you are at um, a position like where we are here on Cumberland Island that gives you really awesome viewing opportunities for many of these shorebirds, wading birds, um, like the roseate spoonbill. So being able to see this behavior up close is absolutely incredible, y'all. Adam, I know that I'm like talking a lot and yeah, yeah feel free to I cut in. I just want to comment too and clarify for everybody where on the island we actually are mm -hmm. because we're talking so much about this tidal area. And so right now we're on the south end of Cumberland, which is obviously the opposite end of the wilderness and adjacent to Florida. But um, this is Beach Creek where we are located currently. Yeah, so we this island is how long is this island, Jessica? Oh man, uh, 17 ish miles. A long island. I think it's the largest right barrier island that we have in Georgia. Let me get a better um, view on this scope. And so being at the south end is essentially the opposite end um, of the of the island. Um, and so that was a really cool view of the roseate spoonbill. Um, and so Adam is going to continue. Oh, thank you. That was very helpful. Yeah. <laughs> Let's see what else we got. My, it, it's hot out here today. I think my it phone's is, overheating a little bit. It is um, very bright and sunny. But in addition to the spoonbill, we've had about every other expected wading bird. We've had green herons. We've had great blue herons, little blue herons, snowy egrets, great egrets yellow crown night heron. So we just need, you know, I think a black Kingfish. crown before I got here, there's kingfishers. Um, so we've had great stuff. Mm -hmm. And as the tide was dropping, we had numerous different shorebird species come in with killdeer and semi-palmated plovers. Semi-palmated, it's kind of a weird technical term you'll hear for some shorebirds. It refers to the webbing on their feet. They're partially webbed, semi-palmated. Um, so if you really are crazy and get a good look, you can actually see it sometimes when they're walking. Um, we've had lesser yellow legs and black bellied plovers. So it's been exciting. And we've been able to demonstrate kind of the diversity of bird life that's here in addition to the songbirds. So let's see what else is going on. Karina, can I interrupt with a question? With yes, some Daddy said people have questions. And so as Adam is kind of getting another bird in the scope, yes, Daddy, please feel free to interject with questions. Um, somebody wants to know where on, where on Cumberland you all are on the north or the south tip of the island. I know you said Beach Creek, but that doesn't mean much to most people. And somebody yeah, so, also asks, um, do roseate spoonbills have natural predators in Georgia? And if so, what? Great question. So we'll start with the first and I'll turn it back over to Jessica to kind of describe where we are. We are on the, the southernmost tip sort of of Cumberland Island that faces the marsh. In fact, if you look in the distance over there, Karina, they might can even see Florida way past Adam mm -hmm. is right there. So we're on the opposite end of the wilderness designation, but nonetheless, this area has really benefited from the level of protection that you know two thirds of the island has. Yeah, so we are at the southern southernmost tip of this 18, 17, 18 mile long island um, and a phenomenal spot for finding birds. All right, Adam. Yeah, reg and regarding predators for roseates, that's a really good question that I've never thought of. I would suspect not many, May maybe a big alligator, could probably take one if it were to get it when they're younger in the nest i'm sure there's a numerous things that could that could take them um maybe maybe a really jumbo sized great horned owl if they were smaller but pro probably not a lot that i can think of um and there are species that's actually expanding in georgia so yeah. i saw someone commented that oh they have those in florida historically they've been much more common in florida 
and just barely dipped into Georgia, but their numbers have been popping up. So if you come down to, especially the Southern part of our coast, um, you can find spoonbills with some regularity if you get out to the marsh and, and can find the right spot. Like Karina said, sometimes or almost always during the lower tides, they're down foraging and they're in these little kind of creeks and you can't see them until they flush up and then you get that amazing shot of pink as they go. So they're here, but um, sometimes easy to, easy to miss. If you want to come over, Karina, we yeah. did have a, uh, another wading bird. Go ahead, have a look. Yes. So that's a snowy egret. Hopefully it's going to still be in the scope for you all. And you can see that little bit yeah. of yellow on the face, the black legs. They have yellow feet too, but that could be hard right now because they're in the marsh. And so uh, they can be covered with mud. So for a lot of shorebirds and wading birds, the leg and feet color can be surprisingly tricky because this, you know, super rich, thick, um, sticky substrate that we have in our salt marshes can, uh, can make it impossible to tell what color the bird's legs really are. Um, but snow egrets are really cool. If you've been watching our virtual bird walks throughout the summer, a few of us have popped up to places closer to North Georgia or around Atlanta where little blue herons and snowy egrets and things like anhingas have shown up because when they're done breeding down here, sometimes they kind of wander before returning back to the coast. Um, so it's cool to see them down here where they're much more frequent. And another bird that is throughout Southern and coastal Georgia and, and is super common down uh, in Florida and other parts to the South. So a really cool bird. Yeah. And it's so cool to just see all of the oysters and like all of the, 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 the living things really. And of course, oysters, um, might look like they're not doing much, but these are an incredible element of the ecosystems here on Cumberland Island, um, particularly on the shores. They help to keep, um, prevent erosion. They're obviously a food source for many animals and a food source for, for, for people among those animals, right? Um, so oysters are a very important element of our ecosystem. Um, now, earlier, Jessica um, was kind of sharing with us some of the protection that exists here on Cumberland Island. And when you are existing, you'll see us go from very shady to very to, to very bright. So please forgive the contrast. Um, but being such an, a biologically important area and our largest barrier island here in Georgia, it's pretty important that we're very intentional about how it's protected and what we're doing to preserve uh, the richness of the biodiversity here. So I'm gonna pass it back over to Jessica to tell you a little bit about the organization that she's a part of and the work that they're doing to make sure that Cumberland Island continues to exist as such an incredible resource for both birds um, and for people. So Jessica, Thanks, back to you. Thanks, Karina, I appreciate it. Yeah, um, while Cumberland is a grassroots nonprofit, but we're really focused on helping to protect the natural resources and the wilderness here on this island. Um, there are a number of really valuable cultural resources here, but there aren't a lot of voices for the wilderness. And I think that, as we all know, um, places that have not been damaged and utilized by humans the way that we are using most of our spaces now um, are certainly one of the most valuable resources for wildlife. Um, and, and just something that, again, even I can, can't say enough, your visitor experience on the South End would be nothing like it is today if it weren't for the wilderness designation on the Northern portion of that island. So it's a really significant congressional level layer of protection that's designed to ensure some of these areas of our ecosystems are protected for the future and allowed to thrive just as they are. Thank you so much for that, Jessica. And it's wonderful to see the work that they're doing because of course it takes large scale management like from the Department of Natural Resources and other government entities, but it also takes grassroots, like she said, organizations really mobilizing and being a voice for these places, these spaces, and oftentimes sometimes people as well where it's needed. And so it's really awesome to be able to see this work happening um, right here locally. Now, Adam has got something in his scope. Um, Adam, are you able to connect to the, oh yeah. I'm back, I'm back. Uh, so I'm sorry, everybody. My my fancy adapter, which allowed my phone to so seamlessly hook up to my scope, was causing my phone to overheat. It's it's a bit toasty down here in about 95% humidity. Um, but now I'm just going to hold my phone. I apologize for being a bit backlit. Uh, purple and size to the sweet that we were showing just a moment ago on the screen. And uh, it's a really beautiful kind of uh, grayish blue over the body and then like a purpley blue up through the head which I'm sure my view is not doing this bird justice and you can see it really kind of being uh, stoic and looking for a little, Adam, little can you, yeah can you sorry. tell us again what you're seeing 
Yeah, I think my, um, my your your bandwidth is low, and you're not your your sound isn't coming through very well. Here we go. I'm going to go ahead, and I've been able to protect my phone from the heat, thankfully. All right, there we are. So, Adam, if you want to go ahead and repeat what you said about this egret. Yes. Uh, so yeah, this time we're looking at a little blue heron. So it's similar to that yeah. snowy egret that we had earlier, but it has this nice dark coloration. Um, and I mentioned if you have been on some of these with us over the summer, we've seen these birds when they're almost pure white. So when they first hatch their first year, they're, they're almost completely white, very similar to that snowy egret. And then they slowly start getting some of these blue colors in. My favorite is when they're kind of a mottled you know, maybe nine months to a year old and they kind of have the blue and the white and they're really kind of special looking. So this bird is at least a year old, probably a few more. Um, and we can tell that again from it's all dark coloration, which is pretty neat. So Adam, again, we've quick been- quick question. Can, yeah. Can all of these, can these wading birds swim? I would bet they could swim. I, I'm not certain. I think they could swim a little bit if they had to, but they would probably do anything they could to avoid it. Um, I know I've seen great blue herons kind of flapping in the water, um, something close to swimming, um, but they, they probably could in a pinch, but it's not something that they would, they would willingly do unless they had to. And so that's a kind of a good point with their, the length of their legs. You know, some of these birds like a great eager or a great blue heron are going to be able to access deeper waters or deeper mud than some of the smaller birds would. And then in theory, different prey items as well. Um, so yeah, I think they probably could, but um, they're not designed or intended uh, to swim for, for much. So that's a good question. Trying to see what else we have out here. So it, it's amazing how well some of these small shorebirds blend in mm -hmm. to the to the ground when you get kind of this much mud we know they're out there we've seen them but amongst the oysters and with that glare on the on the mud they just completely disappear <laughs> um, we might want to ask kim do you want to check over so kim who i mentioned if you missed the beginning kim savides who is our new coastal fellow um, located in Brunswick, Georgia, but she's currently on Jekyll Island. Um, Kim, if you are seeing any birds that are on the beach, we definitely want to give you an opportunity to share with us what you're seeing out there. Um, so feel free to, to jump in. Kim, we can't hear you. Your volume is not good. Okay. How about now? Is it better? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Cool. Yes. Cool. Better. Awesome. Um. Yeah. So, um, we have some birds in our flock still here. Um, this darker bird who um is kind of walking in and out um is a black skimmer. Um, black on top, white underneath, and a really, really long, skinny bill. Um, they're called black skimmers because they'll skim across the water. There's a little bit bigger group over here. Get them. Yeah, you can see one right there in the middle, really long bill. So skimmers will forage by flying really low above the water and dip their lower mandible, which is a little bit longer than their upper, um, down into the water while they're still flying. And they'll skim across the surface until they hit a fish and their, their bill will snap shut. Um, so they're a really, really cool shorebird. Um, in decline, it's uh, state listed in a lot of states um, where it breeds from New York all the way down to Florida. Um, our flock's picking up here. Um, we also had a bunch of royal terns. Um, you can see these skimmers take off. They're really dark color. There goes a pelican as well. Um, but who knows? The flock might be back. Um, so maybe check back in with me. Awesome. Thank you so much, Kim. That was so cool. Um, and so as I said at the beginning, even though we are on Cumberland and Kim is on Jekyll Island, the birds that you're seeing on the beach where Kim is are the same birds that Cumberland Island has. So here on the shores of Cumberland Island, you can also find black skimmers and a variety of different kinds of terns today. Um, and throughout our, my stay here and Jessica's stay here, we've seen lots of royal terns, which are one of the most common terns that we have here on Cumberland Island. Um, and in addition to the many resources that the, this island provides, it also provides nesting for a lot of birds. So we are currently 
kind of moving out of the breeding season for, for many of our birds, whether it's songbirds or shorebirds or wading birds. And we're kind of hitting migration, which is one of the most dynamic times of year and a really important time of year. Um, and Adam, I know you're, are you, did you just see something in the scope? Um, I, I had something, but it, it's, it's proving to be difficult to, to show to you. I will chime in on the skimmer conversation. Um, someone just recently had a flock the other day. We're talking about birds that breed here and migratory birds. So skimmers do nest on the barrier islands. They also migrate through. And some skimmers are banded. I think Kim might have mentioned it, but there are special markers on these birds. And in this one flock, there were three banded birds. And when we looked up, and this was Tim Kais, who's a DNR biologist, the three birds were all banded from different states. One was a New Jersey bird, one was a Florida bird, and one I think was from one of the Carolinas. And so you would have assumed, you know, a flock of 20 some birds that maybe they were all from the same geographic area, but that wasn't the case. And there's still so many questions like that that need to be asked and answered, you know, where are these birds coming from? How do they form these flocks? Why are they breaking up? Um, how do they move? Where are they going? I mean, all sorts of cool stuff. And some of the work Kim uh, has done on other projects uh, and other researchers are starting to be able to track birds. Um, you know, larger birds allow for better tracking. So we're getting more information, but even with smaller birds, we can get things from the level of light that they experience at a location can kind of give us a pinpoint of the latitude where they hang out isotopes and their feathers can let us know where they go from the climate they they experience so um lots of exciting stuff coming uh in in the you know next few years about that type of stuff awesome and that really speaks to why cumberland island in particular is so important because it's not only benefiting birds in georgia as a georgia barrier island um, but because of how well protected it is birds that are flying from other states across this country across this continent are benefiting from the resources that exist on Cumberland Island. Um, and so that's why it's so important for us to continue to make sure that our natural resources on our barrier islands is, is, is well maintained, um, as well maintained as it is here on Cumberland Island. And they're doing such um, incredible work. And so right now, because it's migration, a lot of birds, as uh, Adam mentioned earlier on, are stopping through here to get resources. And this is a large barrier island and it has a lot of resources ranging from uh, resources found on ecosystems like beaches, to, to marshes, to forest, and it really has so much to offer. And I'll give you another view of where we are right now. Um, so we'll take a look. So you can see um, again, a lot of the Serena, folks, oh yeah, yes. Couple more, couple more questions. Um, yes. Can you talk about how you can visit the island mm -hmm. and what is the best time of day to view birds on the island? Awesome, great question. So I'm gonna turn it over to Jessica to tell you a little bit about how you can experience Cumberland um, and what that might look like for you. Sure, so Cumberland Island is a national seashore and you can book reservations um, for a ferry that brings you over from St. Mary's, Georgia, which is located at the very tip of our state in the southeast corner. Um, and it's about a 45 minute boat ride and you can come over for the day if you're brave enough to withstand the heat. Um, if you're a little hardier and decide to camp, actually, Early morning and late evening are great times to be out and, and looking for birds. Um, the advantage of camping at a location like this is getting to experience it at all hours of the day. With a day trip, you're slightly limited to glaring sun and, <laughs> and other elements, but um, it's absolutely doable for a day if you are prepared. The National Park Service offers a great deal of information to ensure that your trip will be successful, that you have enough water and are prepared for the elements you'll incur here. But it is available. I think the only day of the year they're closed is Christmas Day. Mm. Thank you so much, Jessica. Daddy, are there any other questions? Um, what color are the birds when they are chicks? And I don't know which one she's talking about, but I would guess beach nesting birds. Okay. Sure. Yeah, I can take a stab at it. So uh, the easy answer is super complicated in that it, it depends um, a lot. So for example, we're here at the marsh. There's clapper rails out there. Much easier to hear than to see. Rail chicks tend to be really dark in color, and I think that's so they can blend in the shadows and blend in with the substrate. Um, beach nesting birds, they tend to be kind of pale in color and blend in with the sand. So Wilson's plovers, for example, they kind of look like the beach and be easy to just kind of walk right past them. And you can even, going back to the plovers, again, plovers are a type of shorebird. They tend to be kind of upright, they have various numbers of necklaces, little, little chest bands. Um, and the back of them varies depending on the substrate that they like to be on. So a piping plover tends to be on really, you know, nice, dry sand, super pale. And so they're almost like a grayish tan, really light colored. Snowy plovers, even more so. They like salt flats and like the, the beaches of the Gulf. So they're almost pure white. 
Then you get a Wilson's, they're kind of in between like wet sand. And then you get a semi-palmated and they kind of have the color of this salt marsh behind me. So that's kind of cool. And that, that's adult birds, but it also applies to the chicks. The chicks tend to blend in with their substrate. And that applies to what we call precocial birds. These are birds that once they're hatched, they're feathered and they're somewhat able to move. Most songbirds are these kind of wobbly little, <laughs> you know, naked things that are all kind of, you know, peachy colored with a little bit of fuzz. Um, but for the larger birds in the, in the marsh birds, they often blend in with, with the background. Um, and there was something else that was said that I forget. There is something cool over here. Oh, well, let's see. There's something I think is cool. I'm sure it's cool in real life. <laughs> All right, go ahead. All right. So maybe we can put this up on the Audubon page later, but what you're seeing here are a whole bunch of crabs and they're red and you can see the huge uh, claw. Hopefully Karina will have some yeah. luck here. And I want to point it out because of course, before the virtual bird walk started, oh, so bright. we had a yellow crown night heron that was feasting on these and it was oh, picking on. it up and the crab was biting the tongue of the bird and it was shaking it loose. And then it started smashing, oh, so it, bright. smashing it, it's super bright. Yeah. And, um, and then finally was able to break off that claw and then devour the whole crab. It was really cool. And I'm super I bummed I we're not able to show it to you right now in real time, but maybe we can put it on our Facebook page later. Yeah. Um, but the, the yellow crown night heron, it's a popular bird around Atlanta. So Atlanta birders know that they tend to be at Constitution Lakes and along some of our other creeks, like the Big Creek Greenway. But then down here on the coast, they kind of change from going after crawfish, they're going after fiddler crabs and other crabs that are out here in the marsh. They're, they're a crustacean specialist. But it was so cool. And yeah. it was super, super <laughs> disappointed that I can't show it to you right now. Um, and, we got two while I was here and yeah, it, was, it was awesome. Yes, Dottie. Curry, can you speak to where, I, people have, are seeing uh, reports of rosiest spinbells in the Atlanta area. Can you speak to a couple of those locations? I'd... Yeah, I'm trying to remember where they've been seen recently. I know they've been uh, on the Roswell that, River Walk. Yeah, I'll say one spot where I do know they turn up is, is on the Roswell River Walk right there by Willio and Azalea Road just south of downtown Roswell on the north side of the Chattahoochee. There's like a little wetland area that um, fills in depending on water coming out of you for dams. So it can be a great spot for birds or it can be a total bust. And it's pretty much up to however much water they let down. So this time of year, if you go by that area and there's any exposed mud, it can be really good for wading birds or shorebirds. In the winter, if there's standing water, it can be really good for ducks. We've got pintails and other exciting birds. So. That's a, a not reliable, but if spoonbills were to show up, that's a good spot. I think Lake Alatoona has got them on occasion. Um, Constitution Lakes in DeKalb County pulls in a lot of wading birds. That would be a location. But it's if, if spoonbills are in the Atlanta area, normally it's a couple a year if, if the Atlantans are lucky. So it's far from guaranteed or even predictable. If it does happen, it's kind of July through September. Um, but you can also, again, get in your car or however you get down, take a bus, come to Cumberland and, and you'll find them down here for sure. So um, it's, it's, it's worth it to come down and see them. Another good spot we mentioned, Kim, who's on Jekyll. There's the Amphitheater Pond, which is one of my favorite birding spots. You gotta be a little adventurous. It's a dilapidated old structure and you kind of don't know if you're at the right spot, but if you get behind this amphitheater, it's a great uh, wading bird rookery and, uh, and a roosting area. So there's, both night herons, black crowned, yellow crowned, all the other herons and hingas, vultures, and spoonbills. I've had upwards of 50 plus spoonbills at that spot at once. So that's that's a good spot if you're specifically looking for those pink birds. Um, that's a good spot to go. Great question. Any other questions, Dottie? Oh yes, lots of questions. Um, okay. Um, are y'all going to the beach during this? Are y'all going to the beach on this tour, or are you just staying at the marsh? So Kim is at the beach with us. And so that's a great actually opportunity for us to pass it over to Kim, but I wanna show you something before we do that. So um, Daddy, if you don't mind, so we're gonna channel over to the beach um, in just a second to see what Kim is seeing. She's on Jekyll Island, so she's not on Cumberland Island, um, but the birds that she's seeing on the beach on Jekyll are the same exact birds that you will see on the beach on Cumberland Island. So we thought it'd be a good opportunity since she's located on Jekyll for her to share with us what she's seeing. And actually Kim, since you have some birds in the scope. Do you want to go ahead and share with us what you're seeing right now? Yeah, certainly. Yeah, some of our turn flock has returned. Um, and I think still in this view, I had three different species of turns. The thumbnail for my camera is a little small, but um, 
So in the in the back and to the left, I had a Forster's turn, um, who is much smaller and has a bit of a black mask, um, and then um, a darkish reddish bill, um, and then a little bit to the right and back, there was a sandwich turn, which has a dark colored bill. It's a little bit bigger um, and with a yellow tip to it. Um, and most of the birds in this view are royal terns, which are the biggest turn in the view right now. Um, they're a bit chunkier and their bill is bright orange. Um, so if you can make out some of these different guys by seeing their bills, um, this is probably a good example to see. Um, hopefully you can see all three species um, within this scope view. That is incredible, oh. Kim. Thank you so much for sharing that with us. Oh, and turn, oh, and turns are so incredible among the birds that you can find on the beaches of Cumberland Island and our other barrier islands um, because of their acrobatic structure. Um, they're really well designed for a life of, of acrobatic flying and diving straight into the water and catching their fish. Um, and so they're uh, really a cool species, a variety of species to be able to see. And so, so glad that Kim is able to see them. One thing I want to point out right now, so remember we said that the tide had gone out, right? Um, and the, the mud is very exposed out here. You can see all the oyster beds kind of exposed. Well, the tide has now turned and it's coming back in. And Georgia actually has the largest tidal amplitude, meaning the difference between the height of high tide and the height of low tide of any other coastal area in the Southeastern United States. And so I don't know if you'll be able to see this. I'm gonna hold still. This water ahead of me, that's kind of like a little stream in the mud has water moving through it. And that water is coming back in essentially from the ocean. And by the time high tide is reached, you can even see it here on the on this pole. Um, that kind of dark mark is where high tide usually goes. So there's going to be a large amount of water coming in over the next couple of hours to fill this entire place back up. And so you have to be a, 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 a species that has adaptations that allows you to live in such a dynamic environment. Imagine having your, your ecosystem flooded by four or five feet twice a day. You have to be really well adapted to that kind of um, a lifestyle. Adam, do you have something in the scope that you wanted to point out? I do not, but I okay. want to say earlier, someone was asking about time of day to bird here. Part of the reason we were doing this smack dab in the middle of the afternoon when it's super hot was because of this lower tide. So, you know, if you were coming over for a day trip, you get here early, you might want to spend time in the forest, look for those songbirds that are still going to be active. As it warms up, they're probably going to slow down. If you're lucky, then you have a, a, a dropping or rising tide like we do now. Then you can go get the wading birds. And then the same is true for the beach birds. So it's, it can be a little intimidating, to be honest with you, as a Midwesterner who moved to Georgia and you come down to the coast, because you can go to the spot like, oh, everyone says go to the Jekyll South Beach and you go there and there's two pelicans and you're like, this place sucks. Why am I here? Um, the tides really, really impact um, the birds at certain locations. So um, try to learn that or join us on a bird fest field trip next year when we come down to the coast or continue to watch these virtual uh, field trips that we're going to do with with Cumberland and kind of learn that stuff because it's it's a bit tricky if you haven't come down here much, but um it's, it's worth exploring and, and figuring that stuff out for sure. And I Absolutely. wish we could get to the beach um, from <laughs> easily from here, but it's actually probably a good hour's hike over some sand dunes. So we wouldn't have enough time during this Zoom to get here and there, but next time maybe. <laughs> yes, 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 indeed. And so okay, we talked a lot about the birds and we're going to continue to talk about the birds and the wildlife that we're seeing here. But Cumberland Island is pretty unique, both in the wildlife that currently lives here, as well as it's history. And so Jessica, if we can uh, come over to this side. So right now we're currently at a structure that's um, kind of at the south end of the beach um, that we're kind of getting some temporary shade from. Um, but I'm going to kind of peel over here. And if you look off into the distance, you'll notice what looks to be kind of like an abandoned large kind of building ruins of, a, of an old building. Jessica, um, if you want to talk a little bit about what we're seeing over here. Sure, those are called uh, the Dungeness ruins. And those were, it was a former mansion, right? I mean, you can tell that <laughs> by looking at it. Um, that, that burned more than once actually, but the ruins are really um, historically significant. 
on this island and beautiful. And um, there are osprey who actually um, have a nest in the top of the chimney there that come back every year. It's incredible to see. Um, so it's it's a really special place. Yeah, and so even so kind of behind this really large live oak is where those, those ruins are. And of course, it's kind of obscuring our view a little bit. Um, but as you move around the island, you can see a lot of structures that have been, um, that were built long ago and that have seen so so much time pass on this island and um and so when you visit not only are you seeing a lot of the biodiversity you're also seeing remnants of the people that have lived here um over time which actually included um a freedman community of of, of african americans um, as well as many kind of kind of wealthier um communities of people that have lived on this island and so there's a lot going on here <gasps> okay hold on is that our kingfisher yeah. were you seeing it too all right so yeah. as you're talking a kingfisher. Oh, it just landed, Adam. If you're able to, or interested in getting able to get it in the scope. So, birds that aren't wading birds, like smaller birds, like especially songbirds, but even kingfishers, they move around a lot. And so, it's kind of a gamble. So, it landed in this closest tree to us. Um, so, we're going to see. Did it just take off? No, it might be something else. Yeah, it's still there. Oh, okay, we're going to see if we can get this in the scope so we can show you this kingfisher and kingfishers are one of my very favorite birds. I believe it's a she. <gasps> Amazing. Okay. All right. Here we go. There it is. Oh, I just took off. You all saw one glimpse of it. And here comes our rosiest. Wait. No. No. Snowy. Snowy egret. No. What happened? Oh, I'm sorry. I'm <laughs> oh, I'm <water>. sorry. <laughs> <laughs> so sometimes it's, it's interesting, like as a bird moves um, past you as it's flying, you start to see different features of it. Um, and this one just landed, Adam, if, you want, if you're able to get the scope on this one. Um, so we've seen a lot of our wading birds. We've seen a variety of egrets. We saw um, snowy egrets out here, um, great egrets. We saw herons, like tricolored herons, little blue herons as well. Um, this is another one of uh, the kind of white colored um, wading birds that you can see here on Cumberland Island and throughout southern Georgia called a white ibis. And so Adam is going to um, try and get this one in his scope so we can get a good look at it. Got it? Yeah. Okay, awesome. <laughs> yeah, Adam Adam is like the super scoper. All right, now I just have to be the... All right, here we go, here we go. The brightness. All right, here we go. I'm going to try this. Hang tight, everyone. It moved a little bit. Yeah, I'm gonna adjust. Yeah, I can try mine. Well. Do you want to try again? Yeah, let's see. Okay, actually, I got it to kind of work. Yeah, okay. So, right in the center, the brightness kind of cooperated for us a little bit. You'll see this white bird with a long ish neck. Um, but what's most noticeable, hopefully, enough in this view that you're seeing here is the beak shape that is along what's called decurved. Um, which means that it's downward curved beak. Um, and whenever you see a bird with a particular beak shape, especially on the shore, that tells you a little bit about it, in particular what it likes to eat. And so these long bills on these white ibis allow it to dig its, um, its beak essentially into the substrate that it's on, whether it's on um, sand or it's on mud, like it's uh, walking around on right now, and it allows it to reach really far down to get some of those um, invertebrates that are hiding and living in the mud, um, as that comprises a large portion of this bird's diet. And so you can see um, a, a whole host of different beak shapes, body sizes, colorations when it comes to the birds that live on Cumberland's shore, whether we're talking about the marsh or we're talking about the beach. Um, and so it's a little bit hard to see um, because of well, how bright it is and also how uh, many oysters there are, but it's walking around foraging or looking for food in the mud as many birds do when the tide is low. Um, but in addition, I wanted to bring this up. I know we're talking a lot about birds, but me and Jessica have had a really great time this morning. We were on the edge essentially of the marsh and we're right by the ocean um, and right by a tidal river essentially. And that river leads directly to the ocean. And as a result, 
we have a lot of marine mammals that visit Cumberland Island and call Cumberland Island home as well. So we were um, able to see dolphins and manatees extremely close to the shore, which is why the kinds of protections that exist on Cumberland Island, including some of the, you know, the edge essentially right by the water is so important um, because a lot of different kinds of wildlife, not just birds, but also marine mammals um, are relying on healthy edges healthy water next to this marsh and next to the forest, um, which is why advocacy for a place like this is uh, so critical. Um, Kim, uh, I'm going to uh, kind of open it up for you to, to share if you are seeing, um, oh, and Adam, you also, you still have it in the, in the field of vision there. Um, we're getting a lot of comments of people wanting to camp out, wanting to visit, <laughs> um, wanting to, to see kind of some of these birds and other wildlife for themselves. Um, Bird migration is a great time to be here. It really is. It really is. You can see so, so, so many different things. Um, oh, Kim, what have you got? Yeah, um, if I can keep it in the scope here, um, we have two willets that are walking towards us. They're uh, probably still about 100 yards away from me, uh, so a little bit far out for the, for the scope here. Um, but willets are a really common shorebird. Um, and they're not too scared of people like most of the shorebirds. So if you go to the beach, um, you're likely to see a willet. Um, they're fairly tall for a shorebird, um, usually all gray with a long bill. And when they fly, they'll often say their name. So they're really, really loud callers. They'll call willet, willet, willet as they're flying away from you. Um, and when they're flying, they have a cool black and white wing pattern um, that's usually pretty easy to pick up. Um, I can't quite see if they're still in this view or not. Um, but yeah, most of uh, my flock has left. Um, like Adam was hinting at earlier, uh, shorebirds especially are really dependent on the tide. Right now it's dead low tide where I'm at and there's a really nice sandbar about a half mile out um, that I can see the pelicans are hanging out on. So I think most of our flock has joined the pelicans out there to be away from any sort of disturbance on the beach, including myself. <laughs> awesome. Thanks so much, Kim. It's so interesting. Because, oh, Adam, do you have something? Yeah. Am I back here again? I'm sorry, everyone, for all of my uh, phone issues today. Let's see if I can get this in the scope. They're kind of far off. Um, these are nesting birds in Georgia, but also some that do migrate. So up and left the center a little bit, if you really squint, you can see the white throat and chest and then black head and back of an eastern kingbird. So it's again in this little circle of my scope. It's at about eight, nine, just left the center, looking to the left. And again, I apologize, it's not the clearest. But um, Eastern kingbirds are our fly catchers. And so we were talking about our your image. I froze again. <laughs> Man. I'm going to give it a whirl. All right. I'll just forget this time. Yeah, okay. All right. Let's see if we can get. There were a number of them. So as Karina tries to, to pick the birds up, okay. they're, they're not very close. But again, they're Eastern kingbirds. But what's really cool is there's at least four of them. So they're probably a little flock that's migrating together. I've seen nice little groups of kingbirds fly over before here in Georgia, especially on the coast. Uh, jet black on the back white tip of the tail, which is really helpful with their identification, white below. And then one out of every 2000 times, you'll, you'll see uh, a little bit of red on the top of the crown. It's normally kind of hidden and they can flare it up when they're chasing off a larger bird or doing a, a mating display or territory defense. But they're again, a bird that breeds here and they're gonna be leaving the state or they are actively leaving the state and heading down to the tropics for the winter and they'll be coming back you know in, in april uh, next year so a cool bird and as a fly catcher um, not only do they tend to have kind of a wider beak that's a bit flatter so they can pinch those flying insects um, but their behavior they do a lot of what we call sallying where they'll kind of fly out hawk an insect in midair and then come back to a, the same or a similar perch and they'll kind of do that repeatedly if they can find good food from a certain area so um, they kind of range from you know dirt roads uh, anywhere in the Piedmont or coastal plain and then down here on the coast uh, along the edges of the salt marsh, you know, causeways out to, to the beach, you can, you can find the eastern kingbird. And in, in lower numbers, we get western kingbirds in the winter sometimes. So uh, there's some famous spots near Savannah to go look for those once these eastern kingbirds depart. So 
a, a different type of bird that also utilizes the marsh that we're looking at this morning. Incredible. Thanks so much, Adam. And again, those songbirds can be so tricky to get in the scope, but somehow Adam manages to do that. And so we're so lucky to have his scoping skills. Um, now, Dottie, I wanted to real quick check back in with you to see if there were any questions that folks had that you wanted there, to- I have, several, I have several questions. I've been saving them so you all can actually do the trip. Um, <laughs> somebody speak, do Wilson's plovers just stay on the beach or do they sometimes go inland? Okay, someone asked, do Wilson's plovers stay on the beach or sometimes go inland? They're almost always on the beach. Um, I actually, with a Georgia Audubon group this past spring, had some at a, a site called the Andrews Island Causeway. So it's part of, it's, it's brackish water. It's right off of Brunswick. Uh, it's a little spit that goes out to Andrews Island, which is a large uh, dredging site where they put deposited material, keeping channels open for large boats. So that is not fresh water. It's, I assume it's kind of brackish. It's right where the river dumps out. But I was surprised to see Wilson's plovers there. I normally associate them with truly on the beach or in the dunes, right above the rack line where you start to get some vegetation and kind of the dry sticks and things on the beach. Um, so very rarely, I don't know if there's any, off the top of my head, I don't have any sightings in Georgia that are more than you know a couple miles at most from the beach. So they're, they're pretty coastal uh, in their nature. Yeah. Another, question. another question, Adam, um, what do you love about, what do you love about Georgia's barrier islands and can you speak to why Georgia's barrier islands are unique compared to other Southeastern states? Yeah, well, I don't like how it overheats my phone. <laughs> I can't show you the cool birds with my fancy cell phone adapter. Um, I like the Barrier Islands, just the diversity. So I kind of hinted at it earlier. You know, I'm a bird crazy guy. So of course I like to see, actually I haven't seen a manatee yet in Georgia. So when we're done, I'm going to be looking. I've seen them in Florida and other spots, but the, the diversity in general, but the habitats, especially migration. I mean, I'm lucky enough that I get to come down in spring and fall migration most years. And I mean, we've only been able to show you a little bit of that today, but the songbirds, I mean, it's not that uncommon for me to take a group out to Cumberland and have a dozen different warbler species and five or six different gulls and five or six different terns and all the wading birds. And then even the common things we're used to like pileated woodpeckers and there's bald eagles all over the place down here. So just the sheer diversity is great, but in migration, it's really special. Um, I like kind of the undeveloped nature of most of them, but at least the ones I've been able to go through. And even those that are a bit more developed, like uh, St. Simon's or, or Jekyll to a lesser extent, they're still awesome. <laughs> they still have great marshes. I mean, they're just phenomenal places yeah. to come look for birds. Um, we got some yeah. other movement in here. Yeah. So we got a, a tricolored heron I can try yes. to get this scope. Yeah, um, yeah. So I like them just because of, of the sheer diversity that, that we're able to get from a birding standpoint. And the fact that, I mean, hopefully in the background or as Karina has been showing you everything, I mean, there's just the, the maritime forest here. Like when you walk down the main spot in the southern half of, of Cumberland, it's just special. I mean, it's, uh, here you go, it should be, there's some shorebirds calling as well. Oh, okay. um, you know, you get this palmetto understory and these amazing oaks and it's just, I don't know, it feels very special and painted buntings are popping out and um, I don't know, it feels wild and, and lush and alive to me. Mm -hmm. um, I think there was a second part of that question and I totally lost it in my rambling. <laughs> but that's why I like it and, um, and why I try to get down there anytime I can uh, find the time or convince George Audubon to, to send me. <laughs> <laughs> that is a great question. And I actually, um, Jessica, coming back to you, was going to ask Jessica the same question. Je Jessica has a really awesome history um, of experiencing and advocating for and enjoying this island. And so Jessica, why do you love Cumberland Island? I think I would, I would tend to agree the diversity of ecosystems and the the maturity of the recovering maritime forest is exceptional here. Um, it does provide an opportunity to see so many different species at any given time of year. Um, and I don't like the cold, so I really like warm weather, <laughs> um, you know, most honestly. But really, the diversity that you can see here is really unparalleled. And 
Um, I, I wish that under the noon sun we were seeing a little bit more, but it's it, you were not exaggerating on the number of species that we've seen and witnessed in the last 24 hours. We've seen bald eagles. We've seen, um, I mean, really almost everything I can possibly find in my bird book. So <laughs> it's exceptional. That's incredible. Um, and so as you can see, and of course there are just three of us out here, but anyone who's been to Cumberland Island, I'm sure can attest to how incredible of an experience it is. Oh, what are you seeing? Something out there, Jessica, the white bird flying? I think that's a great egret. Yeah. So this is such a special place, especially for our wading birds. They are really well built for life like this. So quickly, you might have noticed that those birds that we were showing you had really long legs. That's helpful when you're dealing with like, you know, very muddy, very kind of icky marsh, <laughs> marsh environment, and not icky in a bad way, but just meaning that it's kind of sticky and there's, there can be, you know, deep water at times. And so they're really well adapted to life out here. Um, now we're getting close to the end of the hour. And I wanted Jessica to have the opportunity, um, if you're someone who's interested in connecting with Wild Cumberland, which is a group advocating for the protection, um, the conservation of the biodiversity on this island, um, and you want to join in too, I'm gonna pass it back over to Jessica to tell you how you can get involved, where to learn more about the work that they're doing um, and what your next step could be. Thank you so much. Yeah, you can check out our website, wildcumberland.org um, to learn a little bit more about the history of the wilderness here and some of the things you'll find and experience and the issues that the island is still facing. Um, and you can sign up. I would really encourage everybody to sign up for our monthly email newsletter because that's really how we keep folks in the loop about what's going on um, in these ecosystems and, and, it's, and the park management. So um, sign up for our email newsletter, visit us online, and certainly always, if you're interested in supporting the stewardship and advocacy for the wilderness, certainly consider making a donation. Awesome. Thank you so much, Jessica. Um organizations that care about protecting um, the natural resources that we have here in Georgia um, for both people and for wildlife are able to come together and share our resources and continue to draw people into how incredible places uh, like Cumberland Island really are. <gasps> Someone's eating. Yeah, why don't you tell them about the rest of our series? Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Okay, so there's so much happening. It's so easy to be distracted by the birds that are happening. Um, and before we wrap this up, Adam, if you, is that the ibis? Yeah, okay, um, I'll try to get come back over to Adam's scope. Let it go. It's, it's eating. There have been, there's been a lot of uh, buffet style uh, eating out here when it comes to, comes to the birds. Let's see if we can get it one more time in the scope before um, we wrap it up. Let's see here. All right, there we go. Yeah, you can really, yeah, this is a little bit better. Let's cooperate. There we go. It is quite bright out there. There we are. And get a better look at that really long curved bill on the white ibis. And they've got a really red colored face and bill as well. So they've got a lot of distinct markings that let you know that you're looking at a white ibis. Um, now, before we go, um, this is not the end of Georgia Audubon and Wild Cumberland working together to share the wonder of this incredible barrier island with you all. Um, we're actually going to be having a series of virtual events um, they cover a variety of topics about why this island is so special and even how you can participate in helping to make Cumberland Island and the rest of Georgia as healthy as possible. It'll be happening over the next few months. You will see um, events posted. The topics we'll be covering inc include um, kind of digging further into what makes Cumberland Island so special for birds and so important for their conservation in so many stages of their lives, whether we're talking about when they're eggs, when they're breeding, when they're migrating, when they're feeding, um, and why this island is so special for that reason. We'll also be looking at the science that's happening on the seashore right here at Cumberland Island, even talking a little bit about sea turtles um, and learning about the work that's happening here. Because again, this barrier island is not only important for birds, but for the diversity of, of marine and terrestrial wildlife that call this place home. Um, and then we'll be closing the series talking about how, um, even though you might be up in North Georgia, up in Atlanta, you are connected to the resources here on Cumberland Island, and we actually all depend on the health of Cumberland Island, even if we're not physically here. Um, so we hope you'll continue to tune in, and we'll be posting those dates and links for signing up. Um, so again, um, from myself and Adam at Georgia Audubon um, and Jessica at Wild Cumberland, um, we're so grateful that you tuned in with us today. Uh, we hope that you will one day come visit. It might seem far away, but it is 110% worth the trek. I'm so glad I did. This was my first time visiting and it was the time of my life. Um, so we will see you all later and thank you so much for joining us. Um, have a great afternoon, everyone. Bye.